everyone, I'm Terry Hawks, and amongst other things in my life, I have had the privilege to be one of the voices of Sailor Moon, which you probably know, which is probably part of the reason that you're here. And I'm really glad you've come today so we can have a chat. Now, it's a, it's a big room and a smaller group of people, so if you're comfortable and you're a few rows back, if you want to come forward, um, we can be a little closer together, a little cozier, or make it a little less formal. I don't even really need to be up on the stage unless it's easier to see me up here. Thoughts around that? Okay, I'm gonna just kinda park myself here on the stairs for a bit. Does anybody wanna move forward? It's too intimidating. I'm looking at the three of you, you're going, no, don't point at us! <laughs> okay, well feel free to move forward a little bit closer if you want. And um, this is Christina up here in the periwinkle hair, and uh, she's just she's she's going to be here to help with any questions that you might have. You can come up to the mic, or if you don't want to do that, stand where you are, and I'll I'll do my best to repeat your question for the group. So, the title of our seminar today is um, the professional world of writing, acting, and directing, and I've. I'm wondering if I'm holding this too close, or... Is that a bit better? Maybe I was too close to that one. Um, and I'm here today, I imagine, to share some of my experience with you, and to ask you if you have any questions. So first of all, it would help me to have a better understanding of um, your interest in being here today. So, by a show of hands, could I ask uh, which of you might be interested in pursuing acting, or in particular voice acting, as a professional career? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven or eight of you. And who among you might be interested in pursuing writing as a professional career? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, about the same. And how about directing? A couple. So a couple of you are interested in writing and directing, it looks like. Okay. And is there anything uh, else that you're interested in, in chatting about today that I might not have mentioned? Put your hands up if you want. Okay. So my thought is that maybe I can share a little bit of my experience with you, and then we can talk about some different elements of a professional career in the arts from my perspective. And uh, I might, along the way, open it up for questions kind of in each section. Does that work for everybody? Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just give you a little background as to how I got involved. And some of you who were here yesterday, this might be a little redundant, so I'll, I'll try not to talk about too long. But um, I always find that it's helpful to know people's stories, and this is just one story. This is just one journey. You all have your own journeys. So my first... Uh, job in the theater was when I was, I think, 11 years old, no, probably 10, and my mother was involved in community theater and came home one day and said, honey, they're looking for a little boy in this play, would you like to audition? And I said, sure, and I got the role, and it was really a lot of fun, partly because I got to act with my mom, and because I really enjoyed the collective spirit of working on a project together, and it was creative and all of that. And that sort of led from one thing to another, and then um, I grew up in Calgary for most of my childhood, and I auditioned for a group called the Young Canadians of the Calgary Stampede, which was a wonderful opportunity for young people who can't afford uh, regular dance lessons and singing lessons, and I was in that category, and some, some of the kids probably could have afforded it, but we were given a full scholarship and lessons year-round, and in return we performed in the grandstand show at the Calgary Stampede, a big outdoor show in front of thousands of people. It was a tremendous training ground. So I, I studied ballet, jazz, tap, acrobatics, and sang. And then I got involved in musical theater and community groups in the city. And a little bit at school, but mostly outside of school. So I just, I loved it. I took advantage of all the opportunities that were available to me. Never sort of dreaming that I would have a professional career. Because I didn't know anybody who did this professionally. I was saying to a friend this morning, I think... It's hard sometimes to imagine yourself in a, in a career, whatever that is, if you don't know somebody who does that or you don't see what's required of you. So to me, it just wasn't even on my radar. I thought I might go to law school and, and have an entirely different journey. And through a series of circumstances, I was offered a couple of jobs that led to a professional job 
in Edmonton at the Citadel Theater, had a great time, and after I finished my bachelor's degree in Calgary, which was mostly a general, general arts degree, I decided to try acting professionally, and I moved to Toronto to do so. I did a lot of theater work in Alberta, and that was great, but I was also interested in pursuing film and television, and there wasn't really a, a, a market for that in Calgary at the time. There's a stronger, a stronger community now in film and TV in Calgary, but Toronto and Vancouver are, are still considered two centers, I think, for the uh, performing arts in Canada. Um, so I moved to Toronto, and I didn't know anything about the profession of acting other than phoning up an artistic director and saying, could I audition for this play I hear you have coming up, that kind of thing. So that's a whole other world when you start dealing with agents and things like that. So I did what I imagined one would do, and I gathered reviews of the plays I'd been in and put together a little portfolio, and I just started knocking on doors. And as good fortune would have it, I connected with one agent, Gail Abrams at Oscars Abrams Zimmel, and she was just starting out and willing to take a chance on me, and I thought she was pretty straightforward and um, honest and principled and I liked her and we started working together and many many years later we're still working together and then they branched out and started doing voice work in their agency Elaine Hammett is now my voice agent and she's fantastic too so that was a good story for me we've had a long-term relationship we've had some challenges and we've worked through them and um, if any of you end up working with an agent, I would advise you to really just treat your relationship with your agent like any other person in your life. Really work through the the, the rough spots and, and try to create some long-term loyalty and, and an understanding of each other. So there's some certain tools required when you go to an agent. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So for me, I then continued my training. I started taking acting classes and auditions for commercials and pretty much anything that came my way. And eventually I started doing small little television roles. Um, I started working in CBC Radio because I phoned up a producer one day and said I'd really like to do this. And he was kind enough to give me a shot. His name was Fred DL, a wonderful CBC Radio producer. And that led to another, to another, and I started to build a community of people who I knew and, and then they started to know my work. And I was very fortunate. I started to, to work. At first I supported myself by waiting tables at many restaurants in Toronto. And it was a good job to have because it offered me flexibility. And the hours that I did work there, I, I made a pretty good salary uh, with tips and so on. But um, eventually I was able to support myself by acting and then eventually writing and directing. So I feel very fortunate. I should also add that it's a tough gig. I was earning in, in the top percentage of my um, union, let's say, before I had my children and also became a mother, and yet I wasn't making a fortune. So the point is, I was very fortunate, I worked really hard, and uh, I was able to make a living, but I was in the minority. It's a really tough business. And the people who work professionally, who even get to that level, have a tough go of it. So what I usually say to young people who are considering this professionally is, if you're passionate about it, if it's what you know you want to do, if it's what you must do, then you must do it. But if not, you might want to think about it twice. And you might want to look at an alternative because it's not an easy road. There's a lot of rejection. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. You're self-employed. You don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. And that's not for everybody. And the older you get in life, the tougher that is. And I can speak for a lot of my friends, especially female friends who are maybe in their 40s and 50s now, and it gets tougher as the years go by. So I just ask you to be realistic with yourself and do a little reality check and say, is this something I want to kind of put all of my energy into and pursue professionally, or could I be satisfied with this as a passion and do this on weekends or do it in some other way in terms of community theater or that kind of thing? And so just my little words of wisdom gleaned over many years in this business. So. 
this has led me to you today. So what, what can I share with you? Um, if you are part of that group who really thinks this is what you want to do, I think there are some steps that would be helpful to you. So I've made a few notes just to remind myself. Um, the first thing is experience or training. And that can be acquired through many sources. What is that? Part of my learning curve has been teaching myself to use computers and become a little more techno-savvy. I am not very techno-savvy, so that's one of my deep, dark secrets. <laughs> but I keep improving. Um, so yeah, actually what I wanted to say before that was I think that there is a real connection between the different art forms that we discussed earlier, acting, writing, directing. So I think my perspective is it's really important for writers, directors, and actors to have an understanding of each other's crafts, and even better, to have experience of each other's crafts. So I, I always find it interesting when directors don't have any experience acting, and I wonder how helpful it might be to him or her to have that experience when they're trying to guide other people through that process. And also as a writer, I think it's a lot easier to write if you understand what the actor's process is and how an actor builds a character and those kinds of things. And conversely, I think it would be helpful for an actor to know what a writer goes through and how much time and effort and painstaking uh, thought goes into every little word in a script. And then perhaps the writer might treat those texts with a little more reverence and so on and so on. So I'm an advocate of interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary training. So I would suggest, anybody interested in this business, take any course that you can afford from a reputable teacher in acting, writing, and directing, and immerse yourself in that world. Learn as much as you can. Volunteer. Volunteer for the community theater down the street, hanging lights, building sets, being a stage manager, ushering somebody down the aisle. Watch as much theater as you can. Take a... Um, a very professional look at the television shows on today and start making notes for yourself. Okay, what kinds of characters are in the top ten shows? What, how could I see myself being cast? Take a look at yourself, what your strengths are, what qualities you have, how you might imagine yourself fitting into, let's say, that mainstream world, and then again, thinking outside the box. Well, if I was going to create my own play or my own uh, radio drama or that kind of thing, what would I imagine myself doing? So just kind of assessing out the terrain. As far as actual training goes, I don't know uh, this area that well. I would urge you strongly to communicate with each other and share information and share resources. But I've lived in Calgary, I've lived in Edmonton, I've lived in Toronto, I've lived in Los Angeles, I've lived in New York, and in all of those places, and I'm, I'm sure more than here, there are workshops and seminars available to people who are considering this work as a professional journey. I would urge you to do your research, check out the name of the casting director or the director who's offering a workshop, and if they are legitimate, if they work professionally and they have a good reputation, it might be worth saving your pennies and making that trip to Toronto or wherever to study with that person for two main reasons I can think of, actually three. One is um, technique. So let's say it's voice acting. There's a certain technique to voice acting and where you hold your mic so you can be heard and you don't want to have it too close because then it sort of reverberates and you don't want to pop your P's and things like that. There's a technique to that craft. So a good casting director or director of voice work would be able to help impart some of those techniques that you can practice on your own. Uh, the second really good reason would be to develop a repertoire of different voices that you could do. So hopefully you would walk away with a professional workshop like that with um, what we used to call a reel, and I'm sure there's a much more current term for it now because it's not a reel-to-reel -reel tape. But some digital evidence of different voices that you could do, that you could share with agents, potential agents and casting directors. And the third reason I would suggest that is 
exactly what I hope you're gathering from this experience, which is to develop community. To start to talk to other people in the waiting room and share information, oh, I hear about this edition coming up, or this other workshop, or that kind of thing, and get to know like-minded people, and be supportive of each other, and try to get past that competitive element that is created for you in an edition waiting room because you're vying for the same job or in a workshop, that kind of thing. If you, I've always thought if you, if you treat your community as a cohort, as a collective, and you're supportive of each other, everyone will benefit from that. So community, I think, is really important. And to that end, just to by the way, I brought some paper and a pen, and I would encourage each and every one of you who would like to be in touch with other like-minded people in the area to come and maybe sign up with an email or other form of communication and perhaps one of you would like to take on the responsibility of sending out a group email and, and just uh, connect in that way and develop some kind of a, a future communication possibility. So that's available to you if you want. Uh, this is not necessarily to communicate with me, but really to build your community and to just expand on the wealth in this room. I mean, you're here for a reason. You all share a passion, and I think that's fantastic. So, training, number one. Anything and everything, community, schools, uh, uh, extension courses at universities and colleges, they're there. You might have to look for them, but they're there. And if they're not, consider creating one yourself. If you had 10 people in this room who wanted to take that course, I imagine you could contact a casting director from Toronto, for example, and say, we'd be willing to find a room at such and such a place and get the technical equipment for you if you would come to us. And what would you charge for that service? And you could create it yourself. <coughs> you have that power. So training. Training is number one. And then once you have the training and maybe your, your uh, demo of the kinds of work that you think you'd be appropriate for, then it might be time to uh, pursue some professional opportunities or some non-union opportunities, that kind of thing. So I'm going to talk in general about acting, but voice acting kind of falls in there. So if you're an actor, for example, you might want to go to the colleges and universities and look on their bulletin boards because if they have arts programs, they're almost always looking for actors, for student films, that kind of thing. Maybe directors, maybe writers, maybe they're soliciting scripts. Check out the bulletin boards in your area. So I would suggest colleges, as I said, theaters, community theaters. Look for opportunities to get involved, to get to know your community. And now I'm sure all of you in this room know better than I do the online opportunities, which have blossomed in the last 10 years. Just be open, take opportunities, seek them out, and grab them. Get to know people and get to hone your own skills. Be unafraid, take risks. Get on stage. Well, uh, je sais de parler français ici, à cette uh, convention. Uh, parce que c'est une bonne opportunité pour moi de pratiquer mon français, mais pour moi, c'est aussi une opportunité uh, to be unafraid. And I don't know how to say that in French. <coughs> Who can help me there? Pas avoir peur. Pas avoir peur. So in other words, I'm trying to speak French here because I want to improve my French and I know my grammar's horrible, but the key for me is to be unafraid. And if I'm unafraid in front of you, then I expand, I grow, I learn how to say new things, I meet new people. So I would, I would support you in being unafraid to take that acting opportunity or to write that script or to write something from a very deep place that you might not really want to share with the world, but you don't have to present it as your story. You can change it up a bit. So, as an artist, to plumb the depths of your soul and be unafraid to take those risks. So they're there for you. Those opportunities are there for you. So that would be the training part of it. Now, the agents. Now, you're going to know this world better than me, but I imagine that there would be um, agents and casting directors in the area, both in the Francophone world and the Anglophone world. Am I right? Can anybody fill me in on that? So I'm seeing some heads nod. I don't know who they are, but I imagine that if you get together, you could start to find out. And those people will have the connections to the commercial producers 
who might do radio commercials in the area, or perhaps the odd on-camera commercial, or the theater companies across the river or on this side of the river, and they can sometimes get you in the door when your knocking at the doors is meeting mixed results. So the kinds of tools that you generally need when you meet someone who might represent you professionally are a resume. A resume is pretty basic. I'm sure if you do other uh, kinds of work outside of the arts, you have a resume of some sort. And it would be good to check online to see examples of professional acting, writing, directing resumes. But in general, it would involve your name, contact information, very important. They know how to reach you. If you're an actor, usually uh, what's required is some physical description of yourself. I'm five foot two, brown hair, my age range is such and such, um, and if you have any union affiliations, that kind of thing. And then uh, a list of training, and I would include everything. If you did that high school production of Guys and Dolls, put it in there. If you um, did lights for the school down the street for such and such a production, put it in there. Put everything in there when you're beginning that will help the person casting understand that you, you have an interest, a passion, an understanding, and you're willing to try different things. And then any professional experience that you might have, and special skills. So if you juggle, if you ride a bike, if you uh, ride a motor scooter, if you have a driver's license, if you speak a second language, those kinds of things are very valuable for the casting people to know because not everybody has those skills. And each of you has something unique. I know this. Think about what that is. Ask your friends what they perceive about you to be unique. And put that on the resume. So that's your calling card. Good idea to have business cards too. And if you're trying to get into the voice world, to have that uh, demo reel of the different voices that we talked about that you can hopefully start to build through workshops and that kind of thing. Directors, writers, I would suggest to people who are interested in directing, follow the acting route that I'm suggesting, get involved in writing workshops, and start to understand what you might be directing. Now, if you're also interested in directing on camera, then that expands into a whole other world in terms of understanding film and photography and, oh gee, wouldn't that photography course at such and such a college be a great idea and I could understand more about lighting and those kinds of things. And believe me, that all of that experience will come in handy one day. You may not expect it right now, but it will. So, the other thing would be, oh gosh, Maybe someday I can find out how this one closed so quickly. <laughs> Drama clubs, community theater, school courses, continuing ed, non-union, oh, and, and now on websites and so on, like the, um, the actors' unions, ACTRA and Equity. I'm sure that they have online bulletin boards for things coming up and, and uh, trade papers and things like that. Get to reading the trade papers. Professional workshops, agents, do your research, and, um, and get to know your community once again. Professional calling cards, the resume, business cards, headshots. That's what I'm thinking of, headshots. So, especially if you want to enter the acting world, people want to know what you look like. So you're going to need, if you've seen any people signing autographs, some people, including me, have headshots. They're um, professional calling cards. They let people know what you look like because it's hard for them to imagine. And certainly if you're working in a, a visual medium, it's important to show what you look like. So I wasn't planning to pull these out, but I'll show you. So now the trend is to have colored headshots. And they're usually kind of neck up. And if you have the resources, it's great to have a couple of different ones. So I don't have another one here, but usually have one. So for example, for me, if I was working on camera right now, I probably would be cast as a mother, a friendly mother, but in the past I've also played a number of villains. So I might have sort of a darker headshot that gives that kind of a, a feel to it. And at one time in my career I, I was on a television series called Traders and I had blonde hair. So I still keep these to show that I can have different color hair if needed. So you're really it's a, it's a tool to help the casting people imagine you in different roles because sometimes their imaginations are limited and sometimes they're just too busy they can't spend the time to imagine you in different roles that kind of thing 
So headshots with a, uh, not necessarily a professional photographer, but somebody who's going to give you good value and, and take a good shot that represents you, really, who you are, not a glammed up you, not somebody who isn't representative of kind of who you are inside, but somebody who can capture your essence and maybe capture a couple of different sides of you. So you have that to share as one of your tools. Um, and also if you're going to do on-camera work, like I was talking, uh, uh, similar to the voice reel, would be some kind of a, a visual reel of commercials or student productions, just little clips that you put together to show people different uh, aspects of your work, that kind of thing. And to build relationships. So you're here building relationships right now. Um, building relationships with agents and casting directors is important. And once you have the tools, the resume, the headshots, the reels, you can start to send out some information. So I would send a letter to somebody along with my headshot resume and ask for a meeting with that person. And then if I didn't hear back from that person, I would very uh, kindly and courteously give them a phone call, talk to that person's assistant, introduce myself and say I'd like to talk to that person. They very likely might say, too busy, call back another time. And I might wait three weeks or a month and I might call back again. But what I would try to do, if possible, is keep working on my own, get involved in that community, play down the street, and invite them to come see me doing some work. Or if I was directing a student production and we had a screening of the, the short film that I did, I would make sure that a large part of my time and energy would be devoted to getting people to come see my film in that student forum because it's much better to see something in a room with audience reaction. Just let people know that you're working. Drop them a little postcard, let them know, or now an email, just say, just want to let you know I'm in such and such a production, or I've produced this, or I have a new script I'd like to share with you. And hopefully they start to think of you. Don't be too pushy, don't phone too frequently. And one of the best pieces of advice I was given by that mentor at CBC, Fred Daly, is the best time to look for work is when you're working. So you create those opportunities for yourself. Maybe you get some friends together, put on a play, produce a script that you've written, and then invite people to see your work. And hopefully it will kind of grow from there. So the relationships you want to develop are with the agents, the casting directors, and they will be online somewhere. Check out with your community and then with the other people within your community. So we have a director over here, we have a writer over here, we have actors over here. You have all the wealth you need in this room to put on a show. You probably have all the wealth you need in this room to create a website or, or there's a gentleman at the back here who said he would be interested in building a studio, am I right? Could you raise your, your hand? So you have people with different, what's your name sir? Bill. Sorry, Bill? Yeah. Bill. So Bill in the red shirt spoke to me yesterday. Bill has an interest in the material surroundings for a studio that one might need to do voice work or set it up. Maybe some of you have technical expertise, a lot more than I do, I'm sure. And you have the skills in this room. So if you don't have the ready-made courses or the professionals here, build it and they will come. <laughs> that's, that's my thought for you on that. Um, plan B. Somebody yesterday asked me about a plan B. Sorry, what time are we at? Halfway through. Okay, then I'm, then I'm going to shut up and let you ask questions. <laughs> um, plan B. I personally did have a plan B, and for me it was education. And it still is education because I'm at a different stage in my life than many of you. So I had the bachelor's degree. I always thought that would open up some opportunities for me later on. And then I gained an interest in writing and I went back to school. I went to UCLA for a playwriting degree, a master's degree. And that was very helpful. And I started writing professionally. Uh, I wrote a film that was produced in Quebec called The Book of Eve. I wrote for a television animation series, Anne of Green Gables, and I wrote plays. And I continue to write plays. I've taken a bit of a break, but now I'm, I'm resuming that part of my life in conjunction with graduate school. So I've gone back to graduate school to acquire some research skills and to learn more about the topics that I would like to write about. I'm studying gender, feminist, and women's studies. 
and I'm doing graduate work in theater studies as well. So for me, my current goal is to be writing with a deeper understanding of the issues I'm interested in and to be teaching at some point in this area that I've had the privilege to work in for so long. So for each of you, it's probably slightly different. Um, I think an education is really important in one's life. That's my personal bias. That doesn't necessarily mean a bachelor's degree. Maybe there's a trade that you're interested in, something that could put food on the table, could pay the rent, and support you during what will inevitably come to you, which would be lean times as an artist. In all the arts, I think we have to expect that. Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So any skills that you can acquire and utilize along the way, I think would be a really wise investment in your time and energy. That's my plan B. I, I, I'm sure you have yours. And, um, and I would just reiterate community again, that your support system, your network is within your community, not just here, but wherever you're from, whatever institutions you're involved with, depend on your community, help them out, help other people out, it will come back to you, it's good karma. And uh, in years to come, you'll remember these early relationships and hopefully you'll be working together professionally if that's your desire. So that's a lot of talking. So now I'm gonna ask if you have any questions and uh, that may take us off on a different, different tack. If you'd like to use the, uh, uh, the microphone, please do so. Can you tell me your name, please? Martin. Martin, plaisir, Martin. Pleasure. Uh, it's not really a question, it's more uh, I wanted to share this. You said at the beginning that there's a lot of rejection, you have to be prepared for that. But I heard an interview between Crispin Freeman and uh, Jack Angel. Jack Angel said, uh, there is no rejection. Rejection is a state of mind that you imply you've been rejected, but it's a game of selection. I love that. They invite people to select one, not to reject the rest. So they select one, you didn't have it, it's not yours, but it's a step on the one that will be yours. Thank you so much. That's such a profound sentiment and I embrace that. It's a much more positive way of presenting it than I just did. And I would agree, you're right. What I would sometimes say, which was probably more along those lines, is it's a skill to learn not to take things personally. So when that one is chosen, as you say, you're so right, that one is chosen for reasons that may have nothing to do with you or, or something that you have no control over. You don't have control over your height or your, your hair color or the amount of hair you have or anything like that. You do maybe have control over whether you grow a beard or how you wear your hair or or how physically fit you are, those kinds of things, but so often the choices have nothing to do with you. You can only focus on the things that you can do something about training, preparedness. Um, I love another saying, if I might share, which is that uh, luck is when preparedness meets with opportunity. So if you prepare yourself and you're ready for those opportunities, then hopefully you will have good luck. Merci, Martin. Merci beaucoup. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm curious, I, um, I know, I don't know your name in the blue and the black, but you put your hand up. Um, yes, you, what's your name, sir? I'm Joel. Oh, I was actually talking to the oh. gentleman behind you, but I'll come, I'll come back to you, because I think you put up your hand for writing and directing, right? I'm Joseph. Joseph. It's close, it's close. <laughs> and I, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing. I would like to know, are you from this area? Uh, from Montreal. From Montreal. And what kinds of opportunities have been available to you to pursue those crafts? Um, do you, do you, am I putting you on the spot if I ask you to speak in the mic? Sorry. Okay, it might be helpful to those around. Um, I haven't really had many opportunities, basically because I'm just trying to like, bridge into the domain. And currently my because you're just trying to what? Bridge myself into the domain. Okay. And currently my employment is not in that field, but it deals with that field because I'm in uh, software testing. Okay. And a lot of the software has like games and videos and stuff like that. So there's like okay. voice acting, I'm just writing for the games and stuff like that. So it's like a big world, a big development. And I was just thinking I would turn this around because 
It might be nicer for people to see your face and not me just to see your face. Okay, so, and is that, is that a world that anybody else is familiar with in this area? Who might share an experience, share their experience? Oh, so sorry, I apologize. Because I'm too far forward? Yeah. Thank you, okay. I'll just, they put me here for a reason then. Don't step out of your box or you call it and wreak havoc. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So, what, what would be of interest to you, Joseph, in terms of developing your skills or... Well, well, it's more along the lines of just getting experience at first. Like right now, I'm, I'm not actually a writer for like seeing a screenplay or stuff like that, but I have been writing um, stories and, um, and and kind of like, over, I've been building worlds in Dungeons and Dragons for like the past 10, 15 years almost. Okay. So I have like a lot of the medieval, a lot of the fantasy, a lot of the like characterizations all like built into um, things and technically, I do have like a small group of actors which are the players of Dungeons and Dragons, so I have like experience in that, but I don't really want to apply it to like the natural industry. Okay, I wish I could be of more help, but it's not an area that I've written for, so I've written for film, theater, television. I'm sorry, but if anybody else has something to share about that, please come forward or maybe. But anybody's expertise is good to listen. Getting one side is better than just getting Absolutely. You did just remind me too, because I haven't talked a lot about my writing, but I have taken online writing courses before. So from a teacher in Los Angeles, you can do your writing and then there's a bit of a forum and you send it in and you can have your writing critiqued and there might be some for your genre as well. I don't know. But um, that was one way of connecting with people who could help hone my technique around writing. So, as for the business end of gaming and, and anime and so on, uh, as a writer, I'm not well versed in that area and I'm sorry for my shortcomings here. Okay, but thank you very much for sharing your experience. Yes, hi. Okay, uh, my name is Serge. Serge? Bonjour Serge, hi. So I'm uh, 40 years old. Well, I want to talk about while we're here at Cinema. Um, I was 24 when the uh, episodes were playing on the YTV, and I was uh, deeply. I had names. I had my own cat named Luna. For 15 years. And uh, so it deeply touched me, those episodes. So I want to thank you for that and uh, maybe. Uh, Ask you some questions. Was uh, Salem the only voice you did? Did you do other characters on the show? Or, uh... No, other than the other incarnations of Salem and Serena, Princess Serena, that right. kind of thing. Mm, I don't think so. It is common practice often to do more than one character, but in this case, also since Sailor Moon slash Serena was such a big part of the show, and there were many other talented actors around. There was there was always somebody else to do one of those extra well, villains or that kind of thing. Right. All Canadian. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was a great group of people. It still is. Keep contact with it. It's been a while. Occasionally, we were a few of us were just at a, a convention in Vancouver last summer, and we connected. That was really special. Yeah. Thank you for your kind thoughts about the show. We'll see. Yes. Would you like to come up? Okay. When you were voicing in Salem Moon, were you aware that one of the characters cast as a woman was actually a man in the original series? The question is, when I was voicing one of the, when I was voicing for Sailor Moon, was I aware that one of the characters in the Japanese version who was originally cast as a man was played by a woman in the series? And re rewritten as a woman. And rewritten as a woman, and the answer is no. <laughs> Can you tell me who that was? Zoe Sight. Zoe Sight, yes. Okay. Zoe Sight, man. Zoe Well, maybe it was just um, maybe it was just some very progressive producer thinking that they wanted to create even more opportunities for women in this very female-oriented series. <laughs> I don't know. I don't well, know. There's the only gay male character in the original. Oh, okay. Man. And because Zoe Sight, they couldn't, they'd have to cut him out in order to make him stop hitting on all the men. <laughs> okay, so so your perception is that Zoe Saif, who was a gay male in the original, wasn't necessarily their choice for a North American audience. Yeah, they they wanted to come from the other country. 
okay? I'm, I'm kind of surprised by that. I didn't know that. Because one of the things I was uh, having breakfast with my friends who have gone back to Toronto, and I said one of the things that I really like about anime, and, and I'm imagining all of you here know more about the genre and the different shows that I do. Uh, um, my experience is pretty focused on the shows that I've been involved with. But one of the things that I love about it is that there seems to be a real acceptance of um, different choices around sexuality and gender and cross-dressing and there's just generally, seemingly, an acceptance of, of differences and different experiences in life and different choices in life. And yeah, maybe not at the well, time. Generally that and maybe that's shifted. Maybe it's... It's mostly the dubs that sometimes take these things out. Yeah. For the North American audiences. Yeah. Well, more back then than now, because yeah. now it's more acceptable, but like 20 years ago it wasn't as accepted, so they kind well, of... Well, now the yelling thing will go buy something if the gay characters know Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is it, over the, the 20 years that we've really had anime in the North American uh, culture, that it's shifted yeah, and we opened just up. Yeah, how much we love the Japanese gay boys, so they left it in. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Yes. The same thing for an um, Neptune and uh, Pardon me. Can you speak a little slower? Uh, a little the same thing for an um, Neptune and Uranus. In the English version, they are cousin. Okay. But if you said the uh, Japanese version, they are couple. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good, good example too. Yeah. Thank you. I think Amy is uh, gay too. Oh my what? God. I think. I'm not I sure. I'm not sure. Know. I don't know. I believe half the cast was originally written. <laughs> 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 and then they never aired the last series or the last season because of the transvestites. Transvestites or crossvestites? Transvestites. Neither. I think it'd be very interesting Neither. for somebody doing a study to um, to look at the cultural influences on a show like Sailor Moon, so the country of origin, Japan, and the cultural influences and what's acceptable and what isn't. And then when it's translated into different languages, many different languages, what are what's a, what's culturally acceptable in Canada versus France versus and I imagine that you would find differences and slight adjustments. And as you say, over the twenty years an evolution in terms of uh, public discourse. It's interesting. Any comments, any questions? Now we don't just have, we've got a few more minutes. We don't have to just limit to the professional world. If you have any questions about Sailor Moon or some of the other work that I've done. Okay, well, I think you already know my name. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to know how you feel whenever you see like cosplays or just pictures of the character that you voice. Like, how do you feel knowing that you made such an impact on someone? Well, not you, but I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> I feel very humbled. I do. Um, I'll t if there aren't a lot, of, if there aren't, there aren't a lot of hands up, I'll tell you a little story. If you want, you might want to sit down because it <laughs> take a couple of minutes. But I've been, I continue to be humbled by my association with this series. And so the story that I will tell you is not just about cosplay, but about, uh, about a little girl who I had a very strong friendship with by the name of Janelle Radicott. And when, um, when this series was playing quite a bit on television in the 90s, uh, a cousin of mine from Calgary phoned and asked me if I would phone this little girl, this six-year-old girl named Janelle in Calgary because she was quite ill and couldn't go to school and watch Sailor Moon from her home about three times a day. And I said, of course, I'd love to talk with her. So I phoned her in the voice of Sailor Moon and then in Carrie's voice. And we developed a friendship. And she came out to Toronto with her mother and stayed with um, my now husband and me and came to a taping session, Sailor Moon. And um, she had to wear a mask when she was in public places. She had an illness called Fanconi anemia, so her immune system was suppressed. But she was one of the wisest, one of the wisest, most generous, kind, and loving people I've ever had the opportunity to meet. And she died a few years ago. But I knew her for seven years before she died, and my life is richer because of her and her amazing family. And 
and she really did a lot with her young life. She was the spokesperson for the Alberta Children's Hospital, and my life is forever touched by my connection to Janelle. I don't, I don't take credit for the impact that Sailor Moon has had on a lot of people. I feel very privileged to be part of the team that produced Sailor Moon. It started with the writers and the producers in Japan, I've never met, and the actors there, and so on, and then the group here, and it is a real collective. But I do think that being part of this series, which was kind of one of the gateways to anime, which is one of the first series to have a girl heroine gather her superpowers and um, and to share her humanity with us, her foibles and her shortcomings and so on. I think that she's she and the other Sailor Scouts have provided us with wonderful role models. And I think it's become clear to me in the years that have passed since we uh, worked on the show. And it, it's coming to conventions like this, and I haven't been to too many, but that bring that to the forefront. So, back to your original question, how do I feel when I see people dressed up? First of all, I'm so impressed with the work that people put into their costumes and the creativity and the resourcefulness and the passion that people show for their characters and their knowledge and the, the depth of understanding of the storylines and the context. and It's really impressive. So, I'm kind of blown away by that. And then, when I have the opportunity to speak to people personally, and some people are brave enough to tell me their stories as to how Sailor Moon might have touched their lives coming into their home and their television set when they were in grade school or perhaps helping them through a hard time in their life and or illuminating a different way of thinking about something, maybe sexuality, that kind of thing. I've heard these stories and I feel very humbled to have been a part of this, this story, the story of Sailor Moon and how it has touched some people's lives. So I feel very humbled and grateful. Well, she's the hero of a lot of people, though. She's, the comment is she's the hero of a lot of people. I think that's true. I think that's true, and I'm really hopeful that Sailor Moon and other female heroines continue to pave the way for other female subjects in all kinds of mediums, in film, in television, in theater, in gaming, there's room. There's room for growth. We live in a much more egalitarian world than we did 50 years ago. There are more opportunities for women in the workplace, in the arts, in the performing arts, but the statistics shall sh still show that uh, there are more male playwrights, for example, directors, artistic directors in the, in the theater world. If you watch film and TV, there's still more roles for men, and actors will generally have a longer career than a number of women. And there's still ageism and sexism and a lot of biases in this industry as well as many others. It's not as explicit as it once was. It's a little more covert, so we have to unpack it a little bit and step back and go, okay, why is that? Well, I would encourage all of you who are writers to consider writing stories about strong female subjects. And if you write stories about strong female subjects, then there might be some, this is, this, is, this is not to put down any opportunities for male directors, but there might be more female directors. There were, if you're writing about women, there are more job opportunities for female actors, and so on. And I think the goal is not to have female-dominated performance art mediums. The goal is to have an egalitarian world, egalitarian storytelling, so that there are just as many stories about strong little girls as strong little boys, and strong middle-aged women as strong middle-aged men, and strong elder women as much as strong elder men. And we all benefit from that. You know, our, our brothers, our sons, our friends, our fathers, the men benefit from that as well because I think it gives us the opportunity to explore the feminine and masculine in all of us. And we don't have to 
we don't have to um, succumb to stereotypes around gender. There's room for more. So I would encourage those of you who might not think of yourselves as writers or storytellers, and especially those of you who are female, think about that. Think of the opportunities that you can create by being proactive and telling your stories and those of your friends. More thoughts, questions, silly questions, any questions, fine. Yes? Please come up to the mic. I'm really nervous, but my name is Nolan, or Andre, and I'm a crazy Sailor Moon fan. Are you? I started watching it when I was three years old, back when it was on YTV. My mom and my dad were always working, so they'd always drop me and my sister off at my grandparents' house. And to pass the time away until my grandfather came home to entertain us, I'd watch Sailor Moon. And ever since then, I developed a major crush on her. I know, that's so cool, that's so brave to share that with us. And I kind of let it slip from memory for the past few years after it came off of YTV and everything. And I got into different magical girl type animes such as Ojimaja Doremi or it's English dub, Magical Doremi or Pretty Cure. And I started getting back into Sailor Moon in February when the anime club at my school, which I now host this year, started playing it again and I started to have flashbacks and I just decided to completely reboot my love for it and I'm working constantly to produce new fan created content for the series, including my own fan character Sailor Andromeda, who is the only male member of the Sailor Scales. Oh. A little interesting factoid that I hadn't really thought of before. That's good for you. So you've really taken this passion of yours and you've created something and you're working towards sharing that information with other people who are interested in that as well. Yes. Awesome. I have just one important question to ask you. Yes. During the first season of Sailor Moon, how did you react to the Molly and Nephlight relationship? <laughs> okay, can you just recap for me? During the first season... That's, that's, it starts to all meld together a little bit, so go ahead. During the first season, when Jedi was eliminated and Nephlight took command of the Negaverse stealing human energy, Serena's friend Molly kind of had a thing for him. So I just want to know, how do you, what do you think of it? Do you think it's a pure love relationship, or do you think it's just kind of unusual? Um, I haven't thought about this in a long time. Uh, I think it's a little unusual. I think there's some elements of the story that are. I don't sit in judgment. I just, I think it's the, the storyteller's license to tell the stories that they want to tell. And I think that crushes and, and um, feelings towards other people are very personal and diverse. And I, I think it was a little unusual, but... I don't judge either. I just really wanted to know from your opinion. Yeah. Tell me, so tell me what you thought of it. I found it a little unusual that a girl who was in love with a man who was about like twice her age, I found it just like a little unusual, especially since recapping on what the others said about how they have to take what's in the original Japanese version and kind of make it approvable for American audiences. I'm just interested to know how that was able to pass, but other things such as suicide being a guy, not pass. You know, I don't have a lot of insight into that because I wasn't involved in that process as a writer or a producer of how those choices were made. And I don't know if you were at one of the seminars yesterday, but... Um, I just came today. Okay. So, my perspective, only my perspective, uh, is that there are some shortcomings in this series, like all series, and I would have preferred to have had all the wonderful elements of this series and these characters alongside a little more diversity, um, cultural diversity, racial diversity, sexual diversity, all of that. 
I would have preferred that the 14-year-old girls might not be as sexualized as they were, because I don't think it's necessary, because I think they're just so strong and interesting without that. And personally, I would prefer that a young person um, might make choices in a relationship that would be healthy, whatever that means. So maybe not that, but I, I didn't write the series. I didn't create the series. And I know that there are criticisms of the series, and I would weigh in on the side that the series had far more positive elements than negative elements in terms of role modeling and um, paving the way for strong female subjects. And I think it's an interesting point to bring up, and I'm sure we could have a very long debate and everybody's different perspectives around that. Thank you. You're welcome. You did really well. No need to be nervous. You did great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. We've got three minutes. Any other burning questions? Yeah, come on. My name is Carolyn. We better talk for my sister since she's not here. Okay. Um, she's been watching Cinema since the beginning. She was in love actually with um, S uh, Serena because she thought, well, she connected with her because she's a lot of like her. Um, there are a few parts that I know that she doesn't like her. She likes to eat. She likes to eat. My sister likes to eat. She's hyperactive. My sister is hyperactive. And um, one thing that I thought was cool is the message that was at the end of the show. And uh, my sister actually gained confidence by just watching the show, and she was really happy. Um, right now, I don't know where she is in the building, but I'd you know, say that if my sister was here, she would probably cry just seeing you here. That's very sweet of you. Thank you for sharing that. If she's around, I'll be at the end of the hall for the other hour. Maybe what I could thank you so much. Um, maybe a response that I could share is to end on a very positive note. Um, that one of the other things I love about the series, which I said yesterday, but for those of you who weren't here yesterday, is I love, I love that Serena is so imperfect. I love that she's klutzy. I love that she doesn't make the best choices all the time. I love that she's kind of grouchy sometimes. I love that she's insecure because we all have that inside of us. No matter what you see, no matter who you see on the street and think they might be successful in terms of their career or their relationships or anything else going on in their lives, we all have that side to us, that imperfect, insecure at times side to us. And all we can do is just keep building on what we know are our strong, unique characteristics and share those with the world. And so what I love about Serena and Sailor Moon is that there are these two sides to this character. This imperfect, developing young person who wants to make a contribution to the world. And then those moments when she gathers those strengths and she shares them and she fights the negaverse and she finds strength in her connection to other people, to those other Sailor Scouts. And I think that's a great metaphor for life. And I hope that that's maybe something we can all take away with us today and when we watch Sailor Moon in the, Sailor Moon in the future, because I have. And I would like to honor those strengths and unique qualities in each of you. And I hope you'll take the opportunity to come up here and sign this paper if you want to stay connected to other people in your area and find strength in collective work and collective experiences and um, strength in the inspiration that we find from like-minded people because I have taken that away from all of you and I continue to do so. Thank you. And I'm thinking maybe we could end in the collective spirit of Sailor Moon and the Sailor Scouts by chanting uh, a very powerful chant. Perhaps today we could go with Moon Prism Power. And if I could encourage you all to stand up and on the count of three, let's do that with, you know, with the arm movement and everything. And let's take all of this powerful energy that we're feeling here today, this collective spirit, and let's take it out with us and fight the negaverse just in the lobby, at home, at work, at school, in your families, just fight the negaverse. So moon prison power on the count of three. 
one. No, we'll do it en français. En français, the counting, and then en anglais, the, the chant, because I don't know how to say that right. So, <laughs> un, deux, trois. Moon present. Merci beaucoup. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time.